U.S. journalists routinely defend their practices as committed to what they variously call objectivity, balance, fairness, evidence-based or fact-based reporting. This commitment is genuine. It arose historically not because anyone denied subjectivity or the subjectivity of human perception, but pre precisely because they acknowledged it. In the 1920s, when American journalists first began to use the term objectivity, subjectivity was everywhere a topic for intellectuals and beyond. Freud was in vogue in America. And in legal theory, the so-called legal realist movement declared boldly that the law is not the law on the books, it's not the so-called black letter law, it is nothing more than what the judges say it is. To study law, you should be studying the psychology and sociology of judges. Uh, because journalists acknowledged subjectivity, they sought practices to hold it in check, to hold in check not only their own subjectivity, but the subjectivities all around them and thrust upon them by government and by corporations. Corporations borrowed tools from World War I propaganda that they quickly converted for public relations purposes. They showered the press with self-serving handouts. Various observers at the time estimated that at least 50% and maybe more like 60% or more of uh, all the stories in the New York Times originated in the work of public relations agents. A commitment to objectivity was not a denial of this, it was a response to it. Today, many observers inside and outside journalism are conducting a war against the ideal of objectivity. Consider Rebecca Solnit, a writer and journalist I happen to admire, who declared uh, in a 2016 commencement address at Berkeley Journalism School, objectivity is a fiction that there is some neutral ground, some political no man's land you can hang out in, you and the mainstream media. Even what you deem worthy to report and whom you quote is a political decision. There is no apolitical, no sidelines, no neutral ground. We're all engaged. Well, it's hard deny, to deny that there is truth in this, elements of truth. Uh, but overall, it seems to me superficial and incomplete. Yes, we all have our underlying subjectivities. But that's exactly why, in different ways, science, medicine, journalism have developed institutional practices for holding subjectivity in check. Now, whether I'm right or Rebecca Solnit is right, I don't think the battles over objectivity have been very productive. And I now believe that the problem, as framed, is based on a very partial appreciation of what values, in fact, in practice, actually guide American journalists. Objectivity does have some claim to priority, uh, in, in part because it's the leading theme in the socialization of young journalists, both in journalism schools and on the job. People come to journalism very often because they want to express themselves, uh, fair enough. Uh, but becoming a journalist is not a free pass to say what you please. True, you do not need a license to, to write and publish news. You do not need specialized training. You can start a blog today if you want. And yet, journalism is closer today than it has ever been to being a contributor to a knowledge society. What is a knowledge society? Um, well, it was actually named that Daniel Bell considered for the title of his book that wound up as The Coming of Post-Industrial Society. But he was trying to name the world we entered in, into roughly after World War II, where the engine of society is less a factory and the assembly line and more the research lab and the, the spirit of critical inquiry that breathes in and around it. I'm very glad to see um, that a journalist, and a most distinguished one, uh, uh, Linda Greenhouse, has served as president of the American Philosophical Society. I know there will be more celebration of her uh, later in this meeting, uh, and I'm sorry I won't be here for it on, on Saturday. But it is my pleasure to speak to you on what I think is a, an especially high 
occasion. Uh, I do not think there has been any prior moment in the history of American journalism in which journalism has been so ambitious and so integral to the production of knowledge and knowledge-centered social practices as it is today. Now, uh, Linda Greenhouse reminded us in her, I think, perfectly titled book, uh, uh, a, a bit of a memoir, um, Just a Journalist. Um, I don't know if I have the intonation exactly right, but it, it is to, uh, to indicate uh, that in the academic world, we've often looked down our noses at journalists, um, but the grounds for that condescension have been trembling for at least 50 years. Well-credentialed academics from Jill Lepore to Stephen Shapin to many likely seated in this room um, uh, have claimed both the title of public intellectual and even, uh, when they're willing to admit to it, the title of journalist. Uh, Linda Greenhouse, just a journalist, I think the next volume uh, should be called uh, Just the Linda Greenhouse, Just the Journalist, You Bet. Um, <laughs> so uh, too often, objectivity is presented as the unrivaled monarch of American journalism, both by its critics and its defenders. But other values matter to journalists and matter a lot. Reporters have not pledged to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Uh, sometimes they withhold what they know to be true, and they do so for good cause. What then are these other loyalties, I claim, are there uh, besides objectivity? How do journalists acknowledge the different values that they hold dear? How do they reconcile contradictions among the values? I'm going to discuss three other values uh, today. Uh, first, Partnered with objectivity is the value of emotionally engaging an audience through storytelling. Second, there's a set of what, for lack of a better term, I will call civility values, um, honored widely and seriously as enclaves of exceptions to objectivity for the sake of minimizing the harm that journalism might do otherwise. And third, there is the value of democracy. Uh, the importance of democracy to American journalism has not been much considered in the U.S. Uh, because it had not been much contested until Donald Trump uh, took it on. Now it is a matter of general concern and widespread anxiety. There are other ideals in journalism that are also serious observed uh, ideals and I'm not going to talk about them today, uh, but for the record, let me mention uh, three of them. American journalists generally feel committed to nationalism or patriotism. Um, uh, I will mention that briefly later. Uh, another value, news organizations are increasingly committed to diversity and inclusion. That is as a matter of social justice, uh, but it's also an extension of the commitment to objectivity making a newsroom encompassing in the perspectives represented inside the newsroom. And finally, there is a commitment in many news outlets to building pride or solidarity in the local communities that they serve. Why do the Philadelphia media uh, pay so much attention to the Phillies, the Eagles, and the 76ers? I think, it, I, I think it's, it's a serious commitment um, uh, to help people talk to one another uh, to reinforce senses of solidarity within a community. So let me turn to this uh, storytelling as an ideal. The value of emotionality, touching the audience, set, sits right beside objectivity on the throne of journalistic ideals. I've noticed this dual loyalty uh, in my 15 years at the Columbia Journalism School. Uh, here, journalists are guided by both the importance of utter veracity in fact-gathering and equally by the pride in telling a story well and conveying some human truths that are no, in no way subsumed under the concept of information. Journalism students are praised when they provide uh, for, for their assignments well-reported or deeply reported work, but also for excellence 
in crafting a story or finding a hook that draws readers in and keeps them there. Report and story are the two sacred terms in the halls of journalism schools. Much, there's much more that might be said about emotionality in the news, and much has been said thoughtfully. I would note particularly the work of the Danish media scholar Karen Wald Jorgensen. At the same time, journalists use the word infotainment as a term of derision. Entertain the art audience? How ignoble. How embarrassing. Maybe drawing a border between serious journalism and tabloid journalism or infotainment is a useful mystification, but it is a mystification. Journalists want to hold an audience, not to help publishers make profits, so that would be okay, um, but to win applause from their peers and to enjoy the intrinsic satisfaction of reaching people, touching, moving them. It's not so different with professors uh, teaching a class or giving a lecture and speaking to a, a society founded by a newspaper proprietor, Benjamin Franklin. I should observe that Franklin himself felt contracted to furnish his readers, as he wrote, with what might be either useful or entertaining. That was his word. Um, it caused him no shame. Civility. In journalism's own mythology of itself, reporters are rule breakers, adventurers, savvy and streetwise. Civil is not a word they would likely use about themselves. They will follow a story no matter how many times they step on toes. But sometimes they choose not to step on toes. One journalism scholar has observed that journalists honor a first do no harm principle that protects individuals from the harm that journalism can do to people that they write about or people in their audience. For instance, protecting the privacy of sexual abuse victims by not using their names in a story. And likewise, not publishing the names of children charged with serious crimes. Many news organizations here and abroad declare in written ethical guidelines that these and other practices, like not publishing details of how people who commit suicide have killed themselves for fear of inspiring copycat suicides. Civility can go too far. By current common agreement, it did go too far in the 1950s and the 19, into the 1960s when reporters were fawningly deferential to public officials that they interviewed. This changed in the late 1960s, or began to change in the late 1960s. Studies by sociolinguists Stephen Clayman, John Heritage, and their colleagues documented the, increased, the increase in assertive questions in presidential press conferences from 1953 to 2000. In the early press conferences, questions were polite requests for information, not challenges to the president's statements or actions. Reporters did not push beyond the president's initial answer with follow-up questions, but questions grew measurably more assertive. While the incidence of more aggressive questioning has had its ups and downs, it has never dropped back to the level of the 1950s and early 1960s. Journalists try to live up to common standards of civility still today, but without falling into insiderism, the clubbiness, or less politely, the corruption that was standard practice in 1950s journalism. If journalism is the publication of information about recent events of public interest or importance, period, there can be no justification for the professional courtesy of 1950s journalism. If those were the good old days, we can be very grateful they're gone. We have moved on to a journalism that is much better than it used to be, but perhaps no better at recognizing its own complexities. Consider the remarks of Dean Becquet, a recently uh, retired executive editor of the New York Times, back when he was the managing editor of the LA Times. And he made the decision to publish a story on the multiple accusations of sexual harassment against the candidate for governor at the time, Arnold Schwarzenegger. In a later interview, Becquet observed, 
sometimes people don't understand that to not publish is a big decision for a newspaper and almost a political act. That's not an act of journalism. You're letting your decision-making get clouded by things that have nothing to do with what a newspaper is supposed to do. In a word, he was arguing, politics is one thing, journalism is another, and never the twain shall meet. Journalism is not politics. What gets published gets published because it is newsworthy, and it does not get published only if journalists decide in the end that it is not newsworthy, or that it is newsworthy but not sufficiently verified in the reporting, not sufficiently bulletproof to criticism. Well, it's never been so clear-cut as that. To cite one example, esteemed journalists and prominent journalist, journalism organization have worked hand-in-glove with members of Congress from 1955 to 1966 to establish something called the Freedom of Information Act, the second such law in the world at the time. Sweden beat us by 200 years. Um, but nobody cared outside Sweden. Um, both the Washington Post and the New York Times have on multiple occasions found themselves working on stories that bore directly on national security and decided voluntarily, maybe with a little prodding, but voluntarily to consult with the Pentagon and the White House to negotiate the details of the story so as to maintain as much faith as possible in their own reporting without damaging the nation's security. In a sense, they uh, appointed themselves assistant secretaries of defense. These were very uncomfortable moments for them. Um, when, when we don't fall, sorry, when, when the premise that we don't do politics fell right off the table. On what grounds? Their judgment. Um, you won't find it in their codes of ethics. Let me turn from uh, civility, uh, or absences of civility, uh, to democracy. It's very much at issue today when the former president of the United States encourages people to believe with zero evidence that an election fairly conducted was in fact the result of a plot to steal the election. Should the news media pounce on Mr. Trump for seeking to undermine democracy itself? Well, uh, U.S. journalism takes democracy seriously, uh, although you don't find it mentioned in codes of, of ethics. What you can find are declarations that journalism is and should be a public service. A public service to what? It's, it's not clear. Um, well, perhaps to democratic self-government, to the idea that democratic self-government helps protect liberty and justice and helps make an honest journalism possible. But what is democratic self-government. U.S. journalists are proud that the press is mentioned in the Constitution, or that it is the only institution apart from the government itself mentioned in the Constitution. But the consensus among historians of the founding era, as I read it, although I know there are historians of the founding era here who know more about this than I do, um, but the, the First Amendment has to be understood from its first word forward. Congress shall make no law. Da, 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 abridging freedom of speech or of the press. Congress, that is the federal government, the Bill of Rights was added to the Constitution as a consensus, as a concession uh, to the anti-federalists who were intent on limiting the powers of the new federal government. Could the individual states abridge freedom of speech or of the press? That was a state matter, a matter of, of state law. And leaders like Thomas Jefferson whose statue stands nobly out in front of the Columbia Journalism School, when he was president, encouraged the states to undertake libel prosecutions of newspapers in their jur jurisdictions. The First Amendment was designed not so much to protect the news media as part of an essential democratic framework as to protect the states and the public at large from a federal government that might turn abusive. And there is no trace of litigation in the first 140 years or so of American history that turns to the First Amendment to protect or to attack a free press. Even Wikipedia, which I hesitate to mention as 
right, my source, but they recognize in their entry on freedom of speech a long list of limitations to freedom of speech and press in the United States. Uh, the list includes libel, slander, obscenity, pornography, sedition, incitement, fighting words, hate speech, classified information, copyright violation, trade secrets, food labeling, non-disclosure agreements, the right to privacy, dignity, public security, and perjury. In the US, uh, the Federal Trade Commission spends a lot of time on a regular basis regulating false advertising, and statutes prohibiting false advertising exist in all 50 states. The claim that no law means no law in Congress shall make no law, is not true, nor was it ever true. What the First Amendment encouraged was free expression, including in the press, within some unstated but reasonable, people say, limits. Many people did not expect Donald Trump to challenge American democracy itself. For the first time in American history, a sitting president sought to remain sitting in office by illegitimate means when the election results favored his opponent. So what's the job of the press when journalism can no longer take for granted democracy as a background value? What does democracy mean? Can or should news organizations proclaim themselves defenders, defenders of democracy and call foul when a president of the United States or a presidential candidate shows no regard for basic democratic values. This is a question not about editorials. It is not about forms of advocacy journalism. It is about news produced by reporters who adhere to the field's standard but uncodified routines of reporting truthfully and verifying reports by widely accepted measures. Are political reporters obliged to declare that Donald Trump has repeatedly lied about the 2020 election? Does this do anyone any good? Are journalists and news organizations committed to democracy as a core value? Should they be? I have been looking through these, some of these ethical codes, about two dozen of them, uh, mostly here but some in, abroad, and in few cases do the ethical codes say anything about democracy directly at all, although they do speak of public service or serving the public good as an obligation. They do spell out in considerable detail uh, the, those things about not naming names of, uh, of children or, or uh, sexual abuse victims, um, uh, the, the questions about how to, how to treat suicide very gingerly. Um, but democracy, it's usually not mentioned. Uh, the French newspaper, Liberation, is unusual in going a bit further, including in their statement, Liber Liberation is not neutral. Every day it sides with citizens to defend their rights against any form of injustice and discrimination, individual or collective. Um, that's as close as I've found uh, to an articulation of democratic values in in any of these ethics statements. Um, it's common in academic circles, at least since uh, Farid Zakaria uh, wrote The Rise of Illiberal Democracy in 1997, uh, to use the term illiberal democracy to distinguish states where leaders have been elected and then have effectively eliminated the chances that they would ever be removed from office. Um, it was in 2014 that Viktor Orban in Hungary, uh, explicitly characterized his own government as an illiberal democracy, proudly. Um, and he has proceeded according, accordingly to reduce the independence of the judiciary in Hungary and to all but extinguish a free press in television and print. Um, online criticism of Orban is still possible. In the US, the founders were dedicated to the proposition that power corrupts and that the federal government especially would work only if First, different parts of the government were elected by different principles, the president by the electoral college, the senate by the state legislatures, that lasted into the early 20th century, uh, and only the house, the people's uh, uh, house, uh, would be chosen by direct popular vote. And the branches of government should uh, check on one another and check one another 
uh, the so-called checking function. The branches of government sh should uh, be separated, not to mention that the federal government is separated in its authority from the state governments. Let, let me come here quickly to a, a conclusion. Pro provisional conclusion, I think it could help if journalists and their news organizations were more clear-minded about their collective values, beginning with their joint allegiance to getting the facts right and telling, compel co telling compelling stories, and moving on to why they sometimes collaborate intentionally and directly with government, and whether their allegiance to democracy is only a vague gesture in the direction of popular sovereignty and not a clear commitment to a liberal democracy. Well, liberal is now a dirty word, uh, so it's okay with me if we call it constitutional democracy, a commitment to a system of checks and balances based on the founders' fears that the people, which is to say the voters, which is to say property-owning white males, would sometimes vote scoundrels into office, even in the highest office of, uh, in the land. Many journalists see great dangers ahead for a free press. They've seen colleagues let go for economic reasons. They've seen growing economic pressures for news organizations to demand that their work be fast and superficial, more clicks, not more depth. They have seen the work of journalists around the world and in the US disparaged, and the personal privacy and physical safety of journalists increasingly placed at risk. But they also see developments with mixed outcomes. There are closer links to audiences, especially uh, very engaged audiences who respond early and often to news reports. There are fewer foreign correspondents, but there are more local stringers. There is more analytical journalism, more investigative journalism. There is more available and easily accessed evidence more global consciousness and global cooperation among news organizations than ever before, more transparency in government, even though there's more secrecy too, more opportunities for long-form journalism, more capacities of very small newsrooms to have very large influence. Journalists practice a much more enterprising journalism than they used to, with some uh, absolutely remarkable outcomes. Uh, but I think their analysis of where journalism is going is probably, this is my judgment, m more, more pessimistic than is warranted. At least in part because I don't think journalists understand very well where journalism has been before. I, I sometimes um, blame Teddy Roosevelt for that. He, he labeled a group of um, reporters who irritated him uh, muckrakers. The term stuck and make us think that there has been an unbroken line of fearless reporting, in-depth investigation from 1906 to the present, which is not at all the truth. Um, that I can go into that another day. Um, but real in, a, a real investment investigative reporting, that's basically 1970 to the present. On democracy as a value, I'm of two minds. On the one hand, I think journalistic rhetoric about democracy is pretty strictly populist. The people should rule, period. Get people more engaged, period. And I stand with the American founders in thinking that this is a damaging oversimplification and the whole Constitution is an argument against it. On the other hand, there's something to be said for vague hand-waving gestures toward democracy rather than precisely defined and amply footnoted elaboration of what makes democracy liberal or constitutional. It's not easy for an academic to endorse fogginess, but fog may have some advantages for the peace and security of a country if a large majority of its citizens feel comfortable to being together in at least saluting a single flag and at least reciting together a relatively simple pledge of allegiance. I do not call for journalists to become political theorists, but they should nonetheless embrace an understanding of democracy that does not reduce it to popular sovereignty, but pairs it with institutional arrangements that constrain the power of elected rulers. Can journalism do more to articulate a richer, fuller understanding of democracy than it does? I think so. Uh, but journalism can't do everything. 
everything. So let me end with a remark more than 50 years old now from Hannah Arendt um, about what journalism in the end does, in her opinion. Without journalists, she wrote, we should never find our bearing in an ever-changing world, and in the most literal sense, we would never know where we are. To speak more kindly of Rebecca Solnit, um, she popularized a very useful term, mansplaining. <laughs> I'll stop mansplaining in a moment. Um, uh, Bernard R Baruch um, uh, was the first to use the term Cold War, but it was written for him in a speech by a journalist. Uh, the New York, a New York Herald Tribune copy editor apparently came up with the term credibility gap. Lyndon Johnson wishes he never had. Um, uh, columnist Joseph Kraft invented the term Middle America that Richard Nixon was happy to pick up. Um, journalists help tell us, simplify for us, explain, show us uh, where we are in, uh, as Arendt said, a rapidly ever-changing world. That's no easy task. Uh, and uh, uh, it's been a privilege for me to be at the Columbia Journalism School and uh, get to know as many journalists have, as I have uh, who um, do remarkable work. Is it, is it intellectual work? You bet it is. Uh, is it serious? Do other people in other fields rely on it? We do. Um, and uh, uh, more power to them. Thanks. I think we're going to take questions. Some questions, okay. Thanks so much. I'm sure Michael will be happy to answer questions. Linda, would you like to start, or should I not put you in that? Ah, okay. Yeah, hi, Mark Thompson. Uh, 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 New York and London. Um, well, firstly, thank you for your optimism, which is, uh, um, I happen to share, but we're a fairly fairly small band in some ways. There's an awful so. lot of pessimism in journalism. I, I think I, I'm a, f a former editor and journalist myself. Most of the editors I talked to today, including, by the way, I think Dean Bacay, would say that the objectivity wars changed somewhat in the later 20 teens. Um, um, and um, it's always been there throughout my decades in journalism as a theoretical argument, but it became somewhat more internal and visceral. Um, it often had the character, has, had, has now got the character of um, uh, being generational, pitting uh, uh, younger members of a newsroom against the editorial elite in the, on the masthead and so forth. And often, although radicalization of politics might be one reason for that, often focused around values and the kind of the spotlight of culture wars on topics like diversity and, uh, for example, the coverage of trans rights issues and so, and so forth. And I guess my question is, have, have you noticed that kind of morphing of... Um, uh, uh, the character of the way objectivity is now debated inside newsrooms at the journalism school and more broadly. And has scholarship begun to look at what feels to me like a, uh, a, a rather hotter period in the, in the debate, just literally over the last five, six years? Thank you. Uh, uh, there's, it's 2004 um, column in the, in the New York Times, um, called is the is the New York Times a liberal newspaper? Um, and the answer was um, th this was from the the Times um, ombudsman. Um, the answer was, of course it is. Um, and there were two two reasons that he gave for of course it is. Uh, one was uh, to say, well, look the title of the paper. It's the New York Times. <laughs> were, well, that means many things, but what he emphasized was it. this is an urban paper. Um, we are more diverse than most of the country. We have a, a, a very diverse and, to some degree, tolerant of diversity community that we are a part of and we are trying to serve. So that, that was one thing. The other 
thing was yeah, that it's not uh, liberal in that it always supports Democrats over Republicans. Uh, it has destroyed a lot of Democratic um, politicians' reputations and careers, um, including the several governors in, in recent years. Um, and um, that, that's not, not where the liberalism is. The liberalism is social liberalism. The liberal, liberalism in 2004 was about um, gay liberation. Uh, it, um, that has something to do with the urbanness too, but it, it was, um, you, you, I think it would have been hard, this is 20 years ago now, to find uh, people outspokenly um, uh, uh, you know, denigrating um, um, gays for being gay. And got even, I don't remember people talking about trans in those days. But, um, but, but gay liberation was certainly on the agenda. Um, and, um, and so was, um, so was equality for women. And again, that was not, did that, was that fully reflected in the newsroom in 2004? No, but um, were, were the values there widely shared in the newsroom? Um, and y yes. Um, so, uh, is it different now? Uh, yeah. I, what, what I'm essentially saying is that now, people of good intentions and serious journalists argue fiercely with each other on this topic in a way which I think is different from 2004. It's become a very live uh, and often angry debate, vituperative debate inside that newsroom. And right. by the way, right. four of our other, other newsrooms I know well are having the same experience on both sides of the Atlantic. Yeah, I, um, I, don't, I don't know enough from inside the newsroom. Uh, uh, I, that sounds right to me. Um, uh, one of my doctoral students is working on the topic now, but um, uh, but she's really really into it. Others, yes. Hi, uh, thanks for that great talk, Howard Gardner from Cambridge. Um, there's one thing you didn't talk about. I don't know deliberately or not, but that's the. I mean, you are a professor, and there's a profession of journalism. Now, many, if not most, journalists also do social media. They tweet. They appear in the media live, and I find that very difficult to square with a profession where you're supposed to be thoughtful and not simply re react quickly and get involved in you know, feverish debates. How do you think about that with reference to your students and more broadly, uh, as Mark suggests, with the, what it means to be a professional journalist nowadays in a world where social media are so powerful? Thanks. Thank you, Howard. Um, uh, I, I, I'm a, a late comer to social media. media. Uh, I remember I was interviewing some Wall Street Journal uh, reporters 2009 uh, when, when Leonard Downey and I were commissioned to write a report on the, the future of journalism. Um, and we, we went out for coffee and these two Wall Street Journal reporters um, were sort of answering my questions, but mostly they were on their phones. <laughs> um, and I think I had just got a, a cell phone um, at, at the time. I'm way behind. Um, but uh, I, I learned, and it, I think it was, it's generally true that reporters in the room can, can tell me, but reporters more than most human beings live on, on Twitter uh, or live when it existed. Or, I mean, it's, it still sort of exists, um, but there are there are substitutes for it. Um, uh, so that 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 does change things. Um, there 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 is a um, you know uh, there's, your, your thumbs become um, reflexes themselves, and and it you're in, you're encouraged to, I think to to be part of that conversation. You're encouraged to, and, and you sort of have to, um, to, to stay up to, um, uh, up to date. Um, is it true that, that Jerry Springer died today? <laughs>
Yeah, I, uh, I learned that from a person across the, the Acela from me. Um, uh, she was 11 minutes behind uh, the, the news. Um, it, 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 it is a different world for, for journalists where you, you, I mean, Jane and Linda can tell you more than I can about this, about what, what that experience is like and the, what, what pressure there is to be right up to the minute. Um, you can be almost up to the minute. I mean, and that, that didn't exist before. Balcony. Conrad Harper, New York City. You referred several times to news organizations, but I'm not sure I ever heard a specific reference either to uh, television news or cable news. And thus, I'm not clear whether the statements you've made have a different application in those circumstances. And if not, was there some reason why you didn't mention such organizations? Uh, the, no, there, there's no particular reason, except I am focused on, on uh, it's slightly embarrassing to use this term, but print. Um, uh, I, I, do, I do read the New York Times online, but I get the New York Times in paper uh, at my door every day. Um, and you read it in a different way, or I read it in a different way. Uh, in part, I wind up it's like browsing um, in the stacks in the library. You wind up seeing things that are important to you that you didn't realize were important to you that you wouldn't have attended to um, if, if you didn't, if it wasn't right next to the thing you really were focused on. Um, uh, uh, and yeah, you could, uh, from what I know from, um, general observation and, and the literature on, uh, academic literature on television, that you know, a lot of this is similar for television, except more often uh, television is getting, to this day, getting its news from uh, newspapers. Uh, uh, and a lot of what moves around uh, the jur in journalistic and other circles, it begins in the work of of um, uh, newspapers, magazines. I mean, the, the New Yorker is, uh, is a crucial piece of this. Um, uh, the Atlantic, others. Um, they, they have the resources to, um, or they're willing to invest the resources in uh, deep and long-lasting journalism. And, and I mean, there, there's an inter interesting study of metropolitan daily newspapers over the last uh, 30, 40 years, uh, studied by a now PhD, but former um, uh, CBS uh, uh, foreign correspondent. Uh, and what she found was uh, that they do more investigative reporting in 2010, whatever, I think that was the last uh, data she had, than they had done in 1990. Uh, or 1980, why more? Um, you know, they're, they're losing money. They, uh, well, um, she also did some interviewing besides uh, an analysis of the, the newspapers themselves. Uh, the editor said, what can we do that television can't do or doesn't do? Um, investigative work that, that will take weeks and months, sometimes longer. Um, we'll invest in that. They can't do it. They can't compete with us there. I think we have one in the back. Oh, hi, uh, Paula Sabloff, Santa Fe Institute. Uh, you spoke eloquently and importantly about democracy, but that not the connection between journalism and capitalism. Uh, I'm particularly concerned about sensationalism in the press and uh, the fact that our former president gets more publicity than the most powerful person in the world today namely President Biden. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that stand. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, in the middle. Robert Post uh, in New Haven. Um, I, I'd like to invite you, Michael, to say a few words about Tucker Carlson. Uh, 
So there's a journalist who seems quite successful when measured by compensation. He seems very successful in doing what in one of your early books you called getting the story, but he seems to flunk the objectivity test rather radically. So in most professions, qua professions, there are criteria of competence, and if you fall below competence, you're penalized. That would be true in law, that would be true in medicine, that would be true in architecture. But take the example of uh, Tucker Carlson and journalism, and what does that say to the rest of us about the profession of journalism as a profession? Other professions, you, like law, uh, you do have to be licensed for. Um, you, you can be removed, um, uh, you know, lo lose your credentials at the bar. Um, uh, that's not true in, in journalism, clearly. And uh, what, what does that say about the profession? It, it, it says that the profession, th there are two pieces, of, at least, of, of being a profession. Um, one is the sense of the participants that they uh, have some um, ob moral obligations, that they're part of a culture that, that values certain kinds of behavior. Um, uh, the, the, the first do no harm principle um, is, is actually written down in the Associated Press handbook and, and such things. But, um, uh, but it's, there, there's nowhere in, there isn't any enforcement of it. The, the enforcement would be, um, uh, you know, the, some kind of um, measures of public opinion. I mean, it, it seemed pretty obvious to um, some of us that uh, Tucker, Par Carl yeah, Tucker Carlson w w was not a genuine journalist. He, he, um, he had the position to um, talk about the news in whatever damn way he pleased, um, thanks to Fox News. Um, there, there are people, there were and there are people at Fox News who take facts seriously. He was not one of them. Um, and they let, they let that continue. Um, for an unbelievably long time. Uh, but, but that didn't matter um, at Fox News. Uh, uh, so I, you know, I, I don't know what to, more to tell you, but, it, but the, 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 the constitutional um, uh, uh, commitment that's evolved over time to a free press makes you know, the, the certification um, highly unlikely that we'll ever have something of that. Can, can journalism organizations do it themselves? Um, uh, they could do more than they have, but, um, but we, we don't have that, that system established. Thank you. Well, I think with that, uh, let me thank Professor Schutzen once more.